This is At Ease, the military podcast of Thomas Nelson Community College. I'm Gary Pounder, a member of the military team here at TNCC. And don't forget, if you're a member of the Armed Forces community looking to start, continue, or maybe finish your education and training, learn more about what Thomas Nelson Community College can help you do to achieve your goals. We've got more than 80 degree and certificate programs, many completely online. Our classes are flexible and very affordable with in-person hybrid and online delivery formats and tuition that's well below the tuition assistance cap, no matter where you're stationed. For more information, active duty members, Guard and Reserve personnel, and military spouses can call 757-825-2938. If you're using uh, VA benefits, call 757-825-3442 or visit tncc.edu slash military. Success is closer than you think at Thomas Nelson, the Peninsula's Community College. Well, on today's edition of At Ease, we are very proud to be joined by Sultan Camp. He is a military liaison, and he's also a strategic recruiter for Huntington Ingalls Industries, which is the parent company and a part of the Newport News uh, shipbuilding uh, complex here locally. It's been a part of the Hampton Roads community, a major part of the local community for well over a century now. They are the largest uh, private shipyard in America. They are the only shipyard that is capable right now of building nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and one of only two yards capable of building nuclear submarines for the U.S. Navy. And Sultan plays a very important role in recruiting military talent to join the workforce down there at uh, Newport News Shipbuilding. So, Sultan, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the podcast. Hey, thanks for the invite there, Gary. It's a pleasure. Always glad to have you. Let's kind of get into your background, your experience. You're a proud U.S. Navy veteran. So if you can, tell us about your experiences in the Navy and maybe how your Navy career kind of led you to your current job at uh, Newport News Shipbuilding. That's that's a that's a great question there, Gary. So back uh, way back pre Navy, I always say that I was a um, a recruiter being late away from joining the Army versus the Navy, right? So as a young high school graduate, walk, walked down to the local Army recruiter's office and said, "Hey, I want to be a soldier." And he said, "Sure, come back in the morning, and I'll be there for you." and happened to show up right at the time that he said, I think it was about 8.30 in the morning, and he wasn't there, but the Navy recruiter was. So he said, hey, what are you doing here, man? I said, well, you know, here to join the Army. He said, what do you want to do that for? <laughs> <laughs> so he grabbed me by the hand. I'm sure that they were best friends after that one. Uh, and thus went my career in the Navy. I uh, had a pleasure of doing 20 years and loved every last bit of it. Traveled a lot, got to see the world. Uh, but at my 15 year mark, Gary, I had to decide what I wanted to do. You know, uh, you know, knew that at, at the ripe old age of 37 at the time that I was still young enough to go on a second career and, uh, realized that when I went to the Navy's transition class, the TAP program, that was an inter- interesting stuff because while I was on still on active duty, helping my service members who reported to me excel in their careers was a major motivator. And I went to one of the facilitators. I asked, hey, Diane, how can I do what you do? And she told me, hey, start volunteering on base and, you know, getting the work experience that way. Still had to finish my education. So I'm going to get in a soapbox here and say, hey, listen, uh, the, the military affords us the opportunity uh, to finish our education and pay for it. So definitely take advantage of that. So uh, got all the things in place in terms of learning the job, building my, my network and getting to the degree. And uh, my first job when I got out, Gary, was actually teaching those transition classes and executive transition classes over there at Naval Station Norfolk. Did that for about two and a half years, saw about 24,000 transitions there, saw some transitions that went really well, and then saw the wreckage of some transitions, whether they were in E3 or in 07, believe it or not, there's some common denominators in there. Uh, Did that for about two and a half years, realized it was one thing to talk about the theory on how to get a job, it was another thing to see the job market as, as it existed in the private sector. So I became a third-party uh, military recruiter for a company called Orion Talent. 
um, and wrote a, a little article that went a, a bit viral uh, called Thank You for Your Service. Now here are nine reasons I won't hire you based on what we don't know when we're getting ready to transition and hang the uniform up. So did that for about two and a half years. And then back in fall of 2016, really got the unique opportunity to join Newport News Shipbuilding, where I have the privilege of leading all of our military spouse and veteran hiring initiatives at the company. You know, you're raising some really good points, drawing on your background, first of all, in the Navy. I've got to ask, what was your primary rating when you were on active duty in the Navy? Ah, so that's, they're in another uh, fate lies, right? So I was a sonar technician. And Gary, when I initially did the aptitude test, they handed me the rating card and said, hey, listen, here's what we think that you're a great fit for. So I, I was reading a sonar technician, works on equipment, looks for submarines. And I happened to just flip that card over, Gary, and I saw the identical write-up. The only difference was one was an STS and one was an STG. So I asked the classifier, I said, hey, this looks like it's the exact same job. What's the difference between them? He said, well, you know, if you're an STG, you don't get the $5,000 sign-on bonus. I'm curious. I'm like, why, why wouldn't I? It's the same exact. Well, you don't get to go on a submarine. I said, well, you know what? Let's talk about the surface side of the house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's indeed funny how we wind up in certain jobs here in the military and what have you. And, you know, I'm guessing when you first met with that Navy recruiter, uh, when you were supposed to be meeting with the Army recruiter, probably becoming a sonar technician was probably the last thing on your mind. But yet you wind up going in that field. And of course, it's a very important, very vital a uh, career field, whether you're on a surface vessel, whether you're on a submarine, because again, what the sonar technician does can literally mean life or death for the ship and the crew. Right. Yep. That's spot on, Gary. Now, you mentioned that you, after leaving active duty, you were teaching tap classes and everything. And you also brought up a very good point. And we have had discussions with other experts in the area on tap and how do you prepare for your transition from the military. It sounds like you did the things the smart way in the sense that you began preparing for that next phase in your life about four or five years before you actually separated, retired from the Navy. Was there anything in your experience, maybe other people you had seen who had gone through the uh, TAP process, the transition process, maybe less than successfully, that told you at that 14, 15 year point in your Navy career, you know, now is the time I really need to get cracking and start thinking about my eventual civilian career, and also getting my education taken care of. Yeah, that's that's where your network is crucial, Gary. Fortunately, I was able to stay in touch with a lot of those uh, fellow enlisted folks and junior military officers who had gone, you know, transitioned years before I did. So a lot of those folks, you know, when we're on this side of the uniform, we've got a lot of lessons learned that we wish we didn't have to, but we're happy that we did. So, you know, that network kind of just always kept a little voice in my head. Hey, Sultan, you know, you're going to be coming up on 20 here soon. What's next? What do you plan on doing? So it was that, that strong network, Gary, that allowed me to kind of be lean into and be a lot more proactive in my transition than most folks are. And that's what we hear from other people that are experts. And, of course, you know, we've all been through the TAP process ourselves coming off of active duty and going into that, you know, civilian phase of our life. But planning ahead and giving yourself enough time to line things up before you make that transition is so important. Again, it sounds like you really did things right. Now, you mentioned when you were teaching TAP classes over there at Naval Station Norfolk that you, I like the phrase you used there, you said you witnessed the wreckage of some of the uh, TAPs, individual uh, transition processes from junior sailors and even some senior officers. If you had to look at common denominators among people that had a rough time making that transition. What were some of the common denominators you saw on the not so successful transitions? And conversely, what did you see among the people who made the transition correctly and smartly? What kind of common denominators did they have? Gotcha. So there's one for both, Gary. Follow up. Right. The people who did not successfully transition didn't know or didn't want to follow up. You know, uh, during the course of TAP, you've got a wealth of resources, a lot of people that say, hey, listen, I'm here to assist you with your transition. Uh, connect with me. 
And only 10%, Gary, 10% of any TAP class that I facilitated would lean forward in their transition, make those connections and follow up. So fortunately, it's those 10% that are successful. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I generally tell anyone that 90% of your job search and transition success is determined by who you know, and then the other 10% is follow-up, yet only 10% of folks follow up. And what is the key to a successful follow-up process? Obviously, you know, you're getting ready to leave the military, you're shooting out resumes, you're applying for jobs. We hear, you know, follow-up a lot, but what do people need to do to really be successful in that follow-up process? Uh, So it's almost... a reverse order of what you just said, right? So firing off resumes, that's the last piece. Mm-hmm. Generally, if you have a passion for what that company does, so in other words, let's use the shipyard, for example. You're following Huntington Ingalls Industries, which is our parent company, on our social media channels. You're following us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and you're watching videos of you know us launching the newest submarine. And now you reach out to someone and you have that common connection and passion for what they do. So when I reach out to you, let's say for you as an example, Gary, I'm saying, hey, listen, Gary, I saw that Thomas Nelson is doing some amazing things X, Y, and Z based on the press releases and social media posts that I've read. I would really love to connect with you, right? So now you're not just the average job seeker. There's a genuine interest in what that company is doing. And you're connecting with that person outside of the interest of getting a job. Now, after that, let's say that I have a conversation with a veteran or military spouse, I'm going to instinctively ask, hey, well, you know what, Gary, tell me a little bit about yourself. And you start, you know, having, once again, building that dialogue. And either, A, we socially connect, at which point I offer you, you know, hey, you know what, based on your background, here are some job titles that I think that you'd be very competitive with. So now comes the resume piece. You already know what types of jobs you are a good fit for. And the follow up after that, after you apply is, hey, listen, Gary, you know, I really appreciate the insight that you, 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 you know, you gave to me. By the way, you also told me that, you know, your production planner scheduler positions are a great fit. I did see one of those position posts and I've actually applied to it. That's your, that's your, 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 your textbook uh, follow up right there. You know, that really is an important point and something that, as you indicate, many job seekers don't do. We somehow believe that, you know, we're all special, that our resume, that our cover letter is somehow going to jump off the page and forgetting sometimes that you may be one of dozens, even hundreds of people applying for that job. And the average recruiter who is going through the stack can only spend a relatively short time looking at each individual letter and resume and application. And if you have, you said, if you've kind of fertilized the field ahead of time by making that social connection, by getting in touch with someone who may be involved in the recruiting and hiring process, letting them know, hey, I have an interest in what your company does. I think I've got some talents and skills that will fit, you know, your operation down there. Then you've put that, 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 that little mustard seed of thought in the recruiter's head. So when he or she does see your application, your resume, your letter, they can make that connection. Absolutely. You know, Gary, it's not unusual. When we post a position on buildyourcareer.com, which is our career site, well, average, based on the position, anywhere between two, 250, sometimes as many as 500 applicants per position. Now, if you have a genuine connection, let's say that you know a recruiter, uh, so you do the math. That's a one in 250 chance if you hit the, the apply button. And, and with the disclosure that you're fully qualified for the position, so one in 250, right? If you know a recruiter that works at that company, your odds go from one in 250 to one in 50. Mm-hmm. Now, you're probably at this point saying, man, Sultan, why is it still one in 50? Well, the bottom line is, We're going to forward the top resumes of which yours is probably included to the hiring manager, but that hiring manager is only going to select maybe between four and five people to interview. Uh, They may bring in two to three for second interviews, and there's only one job. But the bottom line is one in 50 is a lot better than one in 250. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, 
We should point out that, you know, even though these numbers you laid out there a moment ago may sound daunting, it's worth noting that Newport News Shipbuilding is a huge operation. It is the largest private employer in the state of Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. And you guys have openings. You're looking for talent all the time. So if maybe, you know, you don't get that first job you applied for, I would I would imagine you would encourage people to be persistent, to stay after Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, persistence and determination, Gary, that's spot on. Um, I tell folks that, once you have those job titles that you know you're competitive for, keep your foot on the pedal until you have an offer. Because different hiring managers are looking for slightly different things, and I'd much rather a strong, competitive candidate wind up with three or four interviews. They all fall in love with him or her, and they have three or four job offers to choose from. Then they go after the one, put all their eggs in one basket, and not necessarily be the candidate of choice. Now, let's talk a little bit. Again, Newport News Shipbuilding, a huge operation, building nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, submarines, a workforce of roughly 20,000-plus people at any given time down there. So I would imagine the potential jobs and career paths down there are almost limitless. But there are obviously some areas, some skills, some trades that are more in demand than others are. So if you can, talk about, you know, some of the positions that the shipyard is looking to fill and why Newport News Shipbuilding, Huntington Ingalls Industries, go so aggressively after people that have a military background. Gotcha. So let's, uh, let's talk about the why first. Why military spouses and veterans? Well, the short answer, Gary, is they understand what, what, what we do. When we're building a submarine or aircraft carrier, uh, we're building it to be better than our competition, right? Uh, because lives are at stake, our national security is at stake. No one gets that better than our veterans and military spouses. So they understand the importance of our mission or what we're trying to achieve. The other thing is not only are they, they understand our mission, but they're familiar with the corporate culture. Safety is the highest priority at the shipyard, as you can imagine. And for the military community, that is second nature. So we don't have to explain to someone, hey, put on your eye protection or put on your safety shoes. It's a second nature for them. Uh, with regards to opportunities right now, we, we do have a huge uptick in our trades hiring. So refuelers, which honestly, all you have to have is a security clearance. And there's a $1,500 sign-on bonus for that position right now. Ship safety, uh, safe, ship safety watch is another trades position uh, that we're hiring for. And we also have trainee positions. So electri deck electrician trainee positions where you, Thomas Nelson is a partner in that where you go through the training and you have a contingent job offer once you graduate. Those are our trades or represented positions. Uh, on the salaried side, production planner schedulers, typically our officers and senior NCOs do very well uh, competing for that position. It's a project manager type role. You're sequencing out the construction of our, of our product, uh, supply chain, you know, acquisition. Uh, and if you're a little bit more technical, so you've done, you've spun a wrench or twist to the wire, our engineering technician positions who are the subject matter expert on those systems. So we are a small city, Gary. We have our own police and fire departments, as you know. So the sky's the limit, you know, as far as the types of positions that someone may be a fit for. for the company. You mentioned the uh, trainee opportunities down there at the shipyard. And we'll talk a little bit more about that right now. So the shipyard actually is willing to take people that may not necessarily have the desired level of experience or background in a certain trade as long as they meet other criteria you're actually willing to take them and put them through the required training both at the yard and through a, a partner organization like thomas nelson and get them up to speed and then once they get in uh, on the workforce down there train them some more so it's not like, you know, you have to be a completely certified welder or machinist to learn or to land a position down there. You can actually start off, as you indicate, as a trainee. Yeah, absolutely. So across the spectrum, uh, it's a good fit for somebody who is just graduating out of high school. 
Because the starting pay with someone with zero experience, Gary, is $18 an hour with full benefits and a matching 401k. So you may have somebody like that. You may have someone who's switching careers. Hey, I went out and finished up an undergrad degree, and unfortunately, it's not as marketable as I thought it would be. So I need to, you know, I want to do something different. So for those career switchers, it's a great fit for them as well. Uh, as well as uh, those folks who have a passion for the trades. Hey, listen, Sultan, I love being outdoors. I love working with my hands. That's it. I don't want to be stuck behind a computer somewhere. I definitely don't want to manage people. Now, there are leadership opportunities on the trade side, but, you know, a lot of folks, that's the type of work that they enjoy. We should also should uh, point out, too, that um, let's say someone comes in the yard as a welding trainee, uh, you know, a trainee on the machining side, something like that. You're not limited to doing that for the remainder of your career unless you just happen to like that and that's what you want to do. There are opportunities down there to cross-train, and as you point out, there are also chances to advance to move up the uh, corporate ladder. Absolutely. Our VP for trades, uh, Xavier Beal, started off as a welder at the shipyard, and he's now our, our vice president. So uh, to your point, once you're in a position at the shipyard for six months, Gary, you can actually apply to other positions. So to your point, uh, you can come in and find where your passion is. You may love that position that you get hired into the company as and be very successful within that specialty, or... Let's say that you use tuition reimbursement, which we offer, you finish up your degree, and now you want to try something different, you can advance and switch careers internally within the company. And, you know, I want to talk, too, about a very unique training and educational opportunity that uh, Newport News Shipbuilding has had for many, many years. I think it's over a century now. And that is the Newport News Shipbuilding Apprentice School, which is unique, uh, almost I can't think of a a comparable uh, training program in America, but you take young people, many of whom are currently working at the shipyard, some who come in from from the outside, you really immerse them in the shipyard trades for a three-year position, a three-year tenure or, or track or curriculum, and you're basically grooming them to be the next generation of leaders among the trades out there on the yard, but... You're not limiting them to that. Uh, they can move on, you know, and like you said, even climb into the executive ranks if, you know, that is what they want to do. But tell us about the apprentice school, uh, the unique opportunities offered by the apprentice school, and, uh, you know, again, basically what the application process is like for someone coming in from the outside and for someone who's already working at the shipyard and maybe if being a current employee of Newport News Shipbuilding gives you an edge in getting into that very, very competitive program. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, Gary. So it is extremely competitive. The apprentice school sees roughly about 4,000 applications for about 200 slots. And to your point, uh, there's a reason for that. It's a three-year program. You go to school for two days a week. You're into trades for three. You get paid while you go through the program. The intent is at the uh, at graduation for you to have your associate's degree and ready to move into a leadership position within the company. Now, interestingly enough, there is no commitment upon graduation. So, let's say you go through that process and three months, you know, three years into it, you realize that it's just not a fit for you. You can walk away without any obligation to the company. Um, I, I don't think that there's another program like that that exists. Now, how do you make yourself more competitive? You still have to have very strong academics. And, uh, you know, if you're a high school graduate, uh, civic participation is huge. But I generally tell folks, get hired on to the company first. That way you're an internal employee. And if you can demonstrate success being a shipbuilder, you have your supervisor's recommendation. That's also a part of the application process. So... If anyone is very interested in the apprentice school, they can go to buildyourcareer.com. There's an apprentice school tab on there. Uh, lots of information to tell you the application process and, and how to move forward with that. And you mentioned the fact that, again, there's no obligation for that apprentice school graduate to stay with Newport News Shipbuilding. But if I'm not mistaken, we should point out that 
about 80% of the grads of the apprentice school do make it a career. And so that's where you find, you know, these 30 and 40 year master shipbuilders that really are the backbone of the uh, trades and the production side of the house. That's where they come from. They're being grown, they're being developed in house. And as you point out, it's a, it's a really unique opportunity because if I'm not mistaken, I think the last year you're in the apprentice school again, like you said, you're working in the trades part-time, you're going to school part-time, your education fully funded. You're also getting paid, I think, over $50,000 a year by that point. And you are, you know, accumulating time toward retirement. Your 401K is being funded. So it really is the best of all worlds. <laughs> i tell you what, Gary, if I had known about it prior to talking to that Army and Navy recruiter, I think they would have had a, a master shipbuilder on their hands over here. <laughs> I know what you mean because, again, you know, once you, um, of course, I've never been a shipyard employee, but I've been working around the yard, working with folks like you and others at the shipyard to set up things like our skill bridge welding program that we'll talk about here in a minute. And when you see something that is that unique that can offer, you know, those kinds of possibilities, it, it really is very impressive. And I should add as well, if I'm not mistaken, again, that. For folks who do well in the apprentice school, complete the program, and let's say really show an aptitude for math and science, it's not unheard of for the shipyard then, then to take that graduate and send them on to ODU and put them through engineering school. Yep. So you're getting another three or four years of company-funded education, and now instead of going back as a supervisor in the trades, you know, whether it's welding, machining, electrician, now you're coming back as an engineer. And you've gotten a tremendous education, and you've gotten full-time pay and benefits on top of that. And, again, it's a kind of a training track and program that I really can't think of a comparable um, example anywhere else in corporate America. So I think that's a real tribute to not only Huntington Ingalls industry, but also to the shipyard for creating and maintaining that type of, uh, that type of training program. Yes, yep. It truly is. Um, the other thing is, you, you just mentioned, at the end of it, Gary, you're debt-free. Yeah. You haven't had to take out any student loans or any yeah. type of obligations like that. So it is a phenomenal program. Yeah, it, it's amazing to go all the way through you know, an apprentice school and then maybe through an engineering school on top of that and graduate with, like you said, no student debt and money in the bank and a lot of money in your 401K. And it's not a real secret here in Hampton Roads that many of the people that retire after 25, 30, even 40 years of the shipyard, they have a very comfortable and very um, enjoyable retirement because they've been able to accumulate a pretty fair amount of money in their company pension and their 401k. And again, that's yeah. something you don't necessarily see in corporate America anymore. So again, Precisely. you know, one more, one more benefit. Now, again, um, we've been talking about, you know, the fact the shipyard really likes to hire ex-military veterans, uh, military dependents. If someone, let's say, is a military dependent right now, and they're maybe beginning high school, and they're kind of thinking about the future, and they seem inclined to perhaps go to work for the shipyard, what kind of advice would you give to that young person in terms of getting ready and acquiring skills and education that will make them more attractive to being hired on the shipyard once they get their high school diploma? Ah, so one of the key things, Gary, is do a self-assessment and stay out of trouble. One of the biggest things. Uh, and that means if you've got a lead foot, definitely take your foot off of there because it, it boils down to the – the culture, safety. If you've got three speeding tickets in the last two years, that's not exactly the type of behavior that tells me that you have safety on the top of your mind. So, you know, stay out of trouble. And the other thing is, you know, don't be afraid to, to interact with the brand. If you're on Facebook, you are on Instagram, you know, comment, like on the posts, and then ask for advice. Because remember, there's a real social media manager managing those pages. So they're going to see that interaction. And wow, you know what? Gary's interacted with our brand a lot. And then you ask the question, hey, listen, you guys are really in, uh, you know, doing some fun stuff. Any tips for a young high schooler like me who's graduating here in about two years 
Is there anyone I should reach out to? And now that person is going to put you directly in contact with somebody from the company. Now let's so, take, a, take a look at a, a different hiring pool out there. That would be the young service member who was getting out of the military maybe after four, six, eight years. They've decided the military active duty is not for them. But, hey, you know, the shipyard looks attractive. What are some things that young people in that category can do to kind of help prepare them, make that transition into a job at Newport News Shipbuilding? Gotcha. Well, the phenomenal tool that you mentioned earlier, Gary, is the Skill Bridge program. Uh, and that has vis- visibility right now through Senator Tester came uh, to our company and asked about our participate in SkillBridge. So that's a program that's in place. It's here to stay. Uh, that program allows you to really prepare while you're still on active duty to learn those civilian skills and provide that seamless transition into a company. So you know, the bottom line for that is utilize the DOD Skill Bridge program. You know, that's a really good segue to the Skill Bridge program we have here at Thomas Nelson in partnership with Newport News Shipbuilding, Virginia Career Works. We launched it about three weeks ago. It got kind of sidetracked a bit by COVID, but we're getting back on track now. And this particular program, which we've spoken of before on the podcast, it allows that transitioning service member to go into Skill Bridge, which allows them to spend up to 16 weeks during their last six months on active duty to go through a credentialing certification OJT type program. In the case of our program, what you'll do is you'll come to the Thomas Nelson campus to our welding center and you'll spend, depending on the scheduling, three to six weeks in a basic welding program called Shielded Metal Arc welding. At the end of that course, you're going to take two proficiency checks. The first one will give you your certification through the American Welding Society, which is a nationally recognized credential, and as you kind of alluded to earlier, it allows you that if you don't want to stay here in Hampton Roads once you once you separate, you can take that credential anywhere and probably get an entry-level welding job wherever you want to uh, settle across the country. But then the second proficiency check is for Newport News Shipbuilding. And if you demonstrate after going through this basic welding course that you can basically perform basic welds, vertical, horizontal welds, that type of weld, then we encourage you and the shipyard encourages you to apply for a welding trainee position at Newport News Shipbuilding. And from that point, let's say, what is what is the rest of the uh, interviewing and hiring process look like? Gotcha. So for that position, the interview, you're going to interview one-on-one with our trades recruiter. They are actually the hiring decision makers. So once you interview with them, they can say, yes, you're hired or no, you're not. Uh, the next step of the process is we have to do a hair follicle drug test, a medical screening, and a full background check. So that's a national background check as well as a local court background check. To your point, Gary, That's the longest part of the process. So our onboarding typically does take about four to six weeks, which is why it's so important for those skill bridge participants to really get the timing right. Because you don't want the first and the 15 paycheck to go away. You've got a job, but you don't have a start date yet. So to provide that seamless transition, participate in skill bridge, go through the interview process, and then account for that four to six weeks of background, medical, and you can have that that transition between the active duty paycheck and your new civilian paycheck. And we should point out, too, that once you're hired on at the shipyard, the training continues. I think the next step in the training process is you've gotten that initial qualification here at Thomas Nelson. Now you're going to go through a longer welding school or actually maybe several welding schools at the shipyard giving you the more detailed skills and knowledge you need to be a welding trainee in one of the shops down there or actually out there in the yard welding on the uh, vessel that is under construction. And uh, from what I know, and again, not a welder, if you saw my grades in shop class in junior high, you would know that uh, me staying out of the trades was probably a good decision both for me and for potential employers. But You can be very specialized in an area like welding. For example, at Newport News Shipbuilding, I believe you guys have a small group of very elite welders called nuclear welders. Mm -hmm. And it takes, I think, about three years to get all the uh, training and certifications required to be a nuclear welder, which allows you to do welding in the reactor spaces on uh, carriers and on submarines. 
And with that kind of training and certification, those folks are making, I think, over twice what the average welder is making. And they do they do very well. Like I said, they are a very specialized, a very elite group in their services. You know, their skills are very much in demand. Uh, you're spot on, uh, Gary. I know some of those folks that if they had a car payment, they could literally come in on a weekend and work about 30, 30 45 minutes in overtime and make that car payment. Wow. Wow. Let's talk about some of the other um, opportunities down there. We mentioned the trades. We've talked about, you know, things like planning. But um, because we live in an online environment, I know there's also a growing representation at Newport News Shipbuilding in things like cybersecurity. Yeah. So, you know, we're a nuclear shipbuilding facility, Gary. So cyber on both sides of the house, right? So on our sure side, our enterprise, making sure that our networks stay safe, as well as the cyber systems on the aircraft carriers and submarines. So there are a lot of cyber positions and IT positions across the company that are available. Uh, if you love designing and gaming and stuff like that, our designers are you know phenomenal uh, uh, position to get into because that's all they do is model simulation all day, every day. I would also imagine, too, that given the fact that you're building warships down there, you've got to have people that are knowledgeable and expert in what, the other guys, the bad guys are doing out there and being able to really get that information so the designers, the engineers can understand what the threat is and then build capabilities into the next generation of submarines, aircraft carriers to make them uh, more survivable in today's uh, maritime environment. Absolutely. So that's the practical hands-on experience, right? So you have the systems engineers and big Navy that says, hey, this is what we want to do. But uh, we also have folks that have served on that submarine or, or aircraft area. They can say, hey, listen, every time that I walk past that valve in that passageway, that bad boy almost took my arm off. So maybe <laughs> instead of having it angled this way, is there the possibility uh, that, that we angle it a certain way so that that practical experience really, really uh, provides a lot of value? Sure. Now, uh, we've talked about, you know, entry paths for transitioning military for folks coming out of high school. What about young people that maybe have gone through college and gotten their college education, have at least a bachelor's degree? Or on the military side, let's talk about junior and career officers who have a bachelor's, in many cases have a master's degree, other graduate degrees. What kind of opportunities can they find at a place like Newport News Shipbuilding? So the best way that I typically counsel folks that have a background just like you described, Gary, is to go onto LinkedIn. And if you're a Navy lieutenant, use LinkedIn the same way that you would use your smartphone. When I'm looking for a seafood restaurant in Hampton, I type in seafood restaurant Hampton and Google does the, the hard work of finding me relevant results. Well, if I'm a lieutenant with a history degree, and I want to work at Newport News Shipbuilding, type in those words, Lieutenant, Navy, History, Newport News Shipbuilding. And what LinkedIn is going to do is search the 750 million profiles on there to find people that are just like you. So now if there's another Navy lieutenant that works at the shipyard and potentially has a history degree, now you can take a look and say, well, hey, that person is just like me. And they hired them into a project management analyst role. So now I know exactly what types of positions to put on my radar and target my resume to. Now, we know the shipyard does much of its recruiting, as does much of corporate America online. But you also have, as we're getting past COVID now, you also have hiring events. You have job fairs. Do you have any of those coming up? Can you give us some dates, locations for people that maybe like to uh, learn more about a company, pass along a resume, make a connection in that uh, face-to-face kind of environment? Gotcha. So all of our upcoming recruiting events are listed on the Build Your Career website. So if you go to Newport News, you take a look at our calendar page, you'll see where our team is going to be because our trace recruiters are somewhere. Uh, I know that I've got an upcoming trip down to Camp Lejeune here in August for their aviation job there. So that's one great centralized location to, to keep track of 
where we're going to be. Also, LinkedIn. Uh, we generally put if we have upcoming hiring events, job fairs, et cetera, on our LinkedIn uh, page. So go on there, follow the Newport New Shipbuilding, and you'll get in, get that in your information. One uh, related uh, note as we talk about the hiring process, you know, we have focused, obviously, because we're here in southeast Virginia, on the local yard, Newport News Shipbuilding. But we should point out that Huntington Ingalls Industry is truly a national concern and that you guys have other yards, for example, in Mississippi, a large uh, yard, uh, Ingalls Shipbuilding in Pascagoula. I think you have an operation in San Diego. You have some others around the country, too. Is it possible for someone who is looking perhaps to, you know, work at the yard in Mississippi or in San Diego or wherever, is it possible to apply, you know, through the local hiring team here, or should they focus their efforts with the HR staff at those locations where they may want to work elsewhere? So I recommend that they do both. So all of our Huntington Ingalls Industries subdivisions, we have our, openings posted at buildyourcareer.com. On there, you'll see technical solutions, angle shipbuilding. But if you're in Hampton Roads and you re- meet one of our team, we can always do the warm handoff. I could tell my counterpart in Mississippi, hey, Sherry, had a conversation with Gary. Uh, I think that he would be a phenomenal addition to the Ingalls team. He's, he's applied to this position. Could you make sure that his resume makes it directly in front of a hiring manager? Sure. Sure. And just, you know, again, as we're kind of wrapping things up here, during a a given year, how many people are hired here locally at Newport News Shipbuilding? (laughs) So every year, Gary, I've been with the company now for four years, and every year they've said, hey, listen, things are going to cool down a little bit this year, and I've yet to see it. Uh, In the four years that I've been with the company, we've hired roughly about 18,000 people. Wow. Wow. And we should point out, too, that the shipyard currently, and, you know, things can happen with the defense budget. Decisions can be made that affect, you know, the workload down there. But currently, as we said earlier, the only yard in America that can build a nuclear submarine, you guys are the place that's going to be building the new Ford-class carriers. And, of course, you're also involved in building the North Carolina-class attack submarines and you are one of two yards involved in building the new Columbia ballistic missile submarines, too. So there's a lot of work that's going to be done at Newport News Shipbuilding, at the other Huntington Ingalls industry yards over the next you know couple of decades. So I would say the employment prospects and picture down there look pretty good. Yeah, right now, between our carrier construction and our Virginia class program, just in those two programs alone, Gary, we've got guaranteed work until 2042. Now, that's just in a, on the construction side of the house. Remember that not only are we the only folks that build the nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, but we're also the ones, the only ones who do the complex overhaul on them. So we build our carriers the last 50 years, and at the 25-year mark, it's kind of similar to your house where we bring it in, tear it down to the studs, and build everything fresh. Uh, right now, every Nimitz-class carrier out there that's due to an overhaul uh, we're on the on the tank to do that. And we build them to the last 50 years. Some of them are pretty close to the end of that life cycle, Gary, and we're the only ones who actually deactivate the carriers. Indeed. Indeed. We've been, you know, if you, if you drive down I-664, you can still see what's left of the old USS Enterprise down there. And again, it's a very complex uh, process, as you indicate, because you not only have to take you know, key components off of there. You've got that nuclear reactor or reactors that have to be defueled and, and safely disposed of. And again, you know, Newport New Shipbuilding is about the only place that has the expertise to can to not only do the, like you said, the midlife overhaul, but also to decommission them once they reach the end of their service life. Sultan, for anybody who would like to learn more about career opportunities at uh, Newport New Shipbuilding, Huntington Ingalls Industries, What's the best way for them to contact you? Gotcha. So via LinkedIn, Gary, that my contact information is there all day, every day, Sultan Camp. And as I mentioned, all of our career opportunities are listed at buildyourcareer.com.
And how about other people on your team? Again, you folks do a lot of work. You've got a uh, large and active team down there. Other people that perhaps uh, folks who are looking to get hired on at the shipyard can reach out to on your team. Uh, same way there, Gary. They go on to LinkedIn, type in Newport News Shipbuilding Recruiter. A lot of our staff are on LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to us. And uh, my, my general suggestion is you mentioned the volume of folks that would be reaching out. Have an approach that's a little bit unique. You know, let us know what caught your eye outside of the interest of getting a job or why you want to connect. And that's going to increase the likelihood of that recruiter being open to that invitation to connect. And that's a very good point. And we'd like to thank Sultan Camp, who is the strategic recruiter and military liaison for Huntington Ingalls Industry, Newport News Shipbuilding, for joining us here on the podcast. As he indicated, the best way to reach him is through his LinkedIn account. And uh, we highly recommend you go there if you're looking to perhaps make that connection and then uh, maybe follow up and uh, possibly become a worker and employee at uh, Newport News Shipbuilding. We'd also like to thank you for listening to At Ease, the military podcast of Thomas Nelson Community College. For more information on our programs for the Armed Forces community, visit tncc.edu slash military. I'm Gary Pounder. Join us again next time on At Ease.